Welcome to church. We are so happy to have you here with us today. And uh, here we go. Let's have a little message. So I was thinking um, about uh, for this week, and what I came up with is that I could choose again. So Ernest Holmes says in our Science of Mind textbook that all of our troubles come from an isolated sense of being. We alone can return to the Father's house. And so what he's doing here is that he's using that wonderful, wonderful analogy of the story in the New Testament of the prodigal son. And so I'll share this very briefly with you, that a man has two sons, and this is a man who is of significant means. And one of his sons says to the father, Father, give me my portion, give me my inheritance now. I want to go out and experience the world. And so he does. And what happens is he goes to a distant land with his inheritance, and he squanders his inheritance with drinking and riotous living, it says in the Bible. So you can fill in what riotous living means to you. Uh, and then he's broke. He, he, he loses all of it. And he hires himself out to be a servant to someone, and he notices that the pigs that he's feeding are eating better than him. And this is extraordinarily humbling, so he goes back to his father's house, and on the way to his father's house, his father recognizes him coming. And the father is so delighted, he calls the servant and says, you know, slaughter the fatted calf, get a robe, and put a ring on my son's finger, because he was lost and now he's found, okay? Now, the other brother is working in the field all this time, and he sees activity and merriment and says to the servant, hey, what's going on? He says, oh, your brother was lost and now is found. Your father's welcomed him home and is throwing a great big party. Well, you know, the stay-at-home brother is really upset by this. And he says to the father, he says, look, I've been the good boy. I did everything I was supposed to do. You've never thrown me a party. What gives? And the father says to this son, he says, look, everything I have is yours, right? But your brother was lost and now he's found. I think this is very much our spiritual journey. We start one with God, and then we believe the hypnotism, the illusion, the error belief that we are separate, separate from God, separate from love, separate from each other. And our spiritual journey is to get back to the Father's house, back to a consciousness and awareness that we are one, one with God and also one with each other. And I think this is so incredibly important because when we understand that we are really, really one with each other, you know, then how we're going to be with each other, how we're going to treat each other is going to be different than when we think we're separate. And separation is the illusion. Any problem we have anywhere in our life is because we believe in that area we are separate from God. That our circumstance is so special that although God is everywhere, God is not in my special little circumstance. Now, where, so people say, well, with all that's been going on lately, where, you know, where was God? Well, God is always being God fully and completely. And now, in, in humans, we have all been endowed with the ability to do as we choose. So Ernest said this in our textbook, we cannot live a choiceless life. Every day, every moment, every second, there is a choice. If it were not so, we would not be individuals. So, you know, it's not unique to our teaching, the notion that God, that love, you know, can turn uh, the discord, the darkness of the world, the darkness of our life, that God can turn that darkness into light. That shows up in different traditions around the world. It shows up that, that God has the capacity to take the fear that seems to run us and turn that into love. So again, back to our teaching, the science of mind, nothing can permanently heal unless it is accompanied by right thinking. This is what Ernest says. So what is that right thinking? To me, that right thinking is to look at everyone through the eyes of love. Because we know in the science of mind, everyone on the face of the earth is our brother and our sister. So I think that right thinking is we're one. We are all connected. You know, that because we are a metaphysical church, meta means beyond and physical, the phys physics, the physical. So we are interested in what is beyond the physical. We don't just look with five senses and say, okay, that's all there is. There is more than what we perceive with our five senses, that there is a spiritual reality that we are not able to fully even comprehend with these mortal five senses. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So 
right thinking, we are all one. We are all connected. What we do to one, we are doing to everyone. See, I think this is the highest mystical truth in Christianity, in mystical Hinduism, in mystical Islam, in mystical Judaism. That highest, highest spiritual truth is there is only one, there is only one, there is only one, that one is God, and that one is us, right? I have uh, seen a few episodes of this show, uh, Victoria, because you know now we've had some time off, and uh, there's lots of time for viewing things that personally I would probably not normally watch. And so this is about Queen Victoria. And at this point in the story, eh, maybe four or five, six episodes in, she comes together with Albert. And, um, and one of the first things that Albert does <clears throat> as the husband of the queen is that he speaks out publicly against slavery. Now, there was... Um, there was a line in the show that really, really stayed with me, that they're talking about slavery in the United States. And they say, yes, and they call themselves the land of the free. <laughs> you know, So a lot of Europe was already against slavery before we were in the United States. And so all I can attribute this to is that we were a very young country. And a lot of these countries in Europe were much, much older than us. So they had learned the very, the very painful lessons, you know. As the light in the individual soul, though, now this is really important, as the light in each of our souls grows, in other words, as we grow in consciousness, then the spirit within says, this could be different. There could be something better for you. There's more available to you, right? And I think that's what moves us. That's the impulse of spirit that moves us forward on the spiritual journey to have a better experience of life. So what change do we choose to see in the world, right? Because, you know, Gandhi said you must be the change you want to see in the world. So if I just look at the world and say, gee, I wish the world would be this way or that way, that really doesn't do any good. I have to think honestly, okay, I have to be the change I want to see in the world. Where do I want to see change in the world? Well, sure, I want to see change in the world with the healing of disease. So I have to say, okay, Mark, where is your thinking diseased? Where is your thinking not healthy? And now I have to do that quietly. I have to sit and close my eyes and really, really take a little personal inventory here. And then the same if I say, okay, Mark, I see prejudice in the world. Where am I prejudiced? Now, you know, I don't like to think I'm prejudiced. I don't like to think other people I know well are prejudiced. But I suspect everybody has some little thread of prejudice in there. You know? Um, I, uh, and it's ours to overcome that. That once we identify it, it becomes ours to overcome that, to heal that. You know, I feel very, very blessed. I, growing up with my parents, they always told us to bring everybody home. Just bring everybody home, never leave anybody behind. Everybody gets to be included. Um, and, that's, and this seemed really, really to be most uh, uh, discernible uh, when we were all in college. Um, that our, dan our dining table, the dining table at our house on weekends, uh, when we would bring friends uh, from school home, kind of looked like the United Nations. You know, my brother, my sister, and I, we were always bringing people home. And now once these uh, young adults, they, I'd say kids, but they were just young adults, really, um, had come to our home. They were part of our extended family. The door was open to them always, always, always. And we were amazed sometimes how some of these people we would bring home that we really didn't know that well would stop by and visit our parents just because they were in the neighborhood. So perhaps because all of my grandparents were born in what they said was the old country, you know, and their lives had been very, very difficult. They seemed to have a compassion. They seemed to have an acceptance that when I think about it, their compassion for other people, their acceptance for other people continues to inspire me today, and they've been long gone. See, darkness in our world comes forth because we are ignorant of a greater spiritual truth. But the light, light is always revealed by love. And another way to talk about light, light often metaphysically represents understanding. So greater understanding is revealed by us being in a place, in a consciousness, a mindset, a thinking that is loving. Hmm? So God did not create the darkness in the world. We did. Hmm, I know nobody likes to hear that. You say, well, how? How? Well, through the ongoing negativity of fear, 
uh, through the belief that we are separate from each other, through the belief in scarcity. You know, I think that scarcity is behind so much negativity in the world that people just don't think there's enough. There's not enough for me, there's not enough love, there's not enough opportunity, there's not enough good jobs. When the truth is, we teach in science of mind that we live in an abundant universe. And so maybe, maybe our job in the science of mind is to teach other people that they can have and they can create themselves the abundant life that they would like to be living. Hmm? So the darkness comes from a manifestation of our human mind. You know, and, and I think this is interesting. It comes from A Course in Miracles. In the Course, it says, in any darkness, in any problem, recognize the darkness is an effect of a lack of love coming at you and from you. It doesn't come from God. I think, wow. When I see darkness in the world, I have to really look within myself and say, hmm, where is there a lack of love in me? Where is the, the light not burning brightly? Where am I not being open and loving and giving and forgiving? See, because we call forth a higher power. Because we believe that with God, all things are possible. This is our teaching. With God, all things are possible. So I don't know how. I don't know how the, the, the appearance of virus will be solved. I don't know what the answer is to that, but I know that answer exists in the mind of God. I don't know the answer to all of the other challenges that are taking place in the world, but I know there is an answer, there is a solution in the infinite mind of God. And this is what we must turn to again and again and again. Humanly, I don't know, but I know that God, the infinite mind, does know. And if we will take the time and make the effort to listen to that, it will reveal to us exactly how we need to be, what we need to do, where we need to go. So what about during a time of tremendous civil discourse like we are having right now? What about during a pandemic? Yes, absolutely. Can I see God? In other words, can I see love in that? And yes, I can. Yes, we all can. We can all see instances. It's like the sun cracking through the clouds where God is present in what looks so, so challenging. See, because God can use everything for a greater good if we will let it. God can use everything. Everything that's taking place in the world right now, God can use that to bring about a greater good if we will let it. So I think we must know that good will come out of all of this all that's taking place in our world today. And if it does not, it's because we are dragging the past into the present, right? We're not allowing something new to be created. In A Course in Miracles, again, it says that the principle of resurrection is a demonstration that you are not at the effects of lovelessness. See, we resurrect, we lift up our life, we get beyond conditions, we have healing through the power and energy of love that we call God. So in God, you know, there's no time. In God, there's no space. You know, we say all the time that Einstein said we made up time and space, that those are constructs, those are human constructs. So we can always, always choose again. Don't think about time being a limitation or space being a limitation doesn't matter. We can choose again. We can choose in any moment to see a situation or a person or a group of people. We can see them differently if we are willing. If you're not there yet, then be willing. Be willing to be willing. Be willing to be willing to be willing, right? Because willingness counts for a lot. You know, there has to be a crucifixion before there can be a resurrection, right? And so I don't think we have to look far to say that there's crucifixion happening all around us right now. Okay, so that means we are open, we are ready, we are preparing ourselves, at least I hope we are preparing, for a resurrection that will be a blessing to everyone. Right? We are one mind. What we do, what we think, what we say, how we act affects all of us. All of us, all of us. Right? You know, I think being adults... I think one of the great things about being adults is that we can admit when we are wrong and set about cleaning things up. And so if that's what we need to do, then God help us do it. You know, I love Anne Lamott, the writer Anne Lamott, and she says there are basically three prayers. She says that all prayers fall into three categories. They are help, thanks, and wow. 
And so one of those help prayers is, God, help us to be the people we need to be to make this world what it can be. Yes. So remember, when we change, the world changes, and actually, it never changes a minute before we do. Won't you choose again with me? Let's pray. Oh, wait, before we pray, I have something I wanted to share. And I love this. And I just thought this kind of fit with today. So this will be the opening to the prayer. And, um, and it came to me at the last minute, which is why I'm reading it off my computer. But it comes from uh, wonderful, wonderful Maya Angelou. And this is her poem called Human Family. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived, are true profundity, and others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight. Brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jibe, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. We love and lose in China, we weep on England's moors, and laugh and moan in Guinea, and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine, in minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Join me in prayer right now. As we turn our attention inward for a moment, recognizing that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit, that the very principle, power, and presence of God that's everywhere in the universe is right where we are. And the truth is that we are one with God and one with all beings everywhere. So in this awareness of our oneness with God, I speak the word that great healing is taking place in our planet today. I claim for all of us that there is a healing of all appearance of disease, that there is a healing of all appearance of discord, that there is a healing of all appearance of separation or otherness. I know the truth of God is love. The truth of God is one. And we accept this, filling our minds and emanating from our hearts into all that we think and say and do today. So any place where the darkness seems to have resided in our thinking, I claim for us today that we are open and willing and receptive to God's light. And I know the darkness doesn't argue with the light that the light just casts out the darkness. So we welcome God's love in a greater way than ever before. And we commit within ourselves to be a transparency for God's love in the world more than we have ever been. So we include in our prayer today all of the situations in the world that have pulled at our attention this week. And so knowing that the love of God within us is infinite, we send love out from where we are to all of those people who would be benefited, who would be blessed, who would be healed in any way by the love of God, the love of pure spirit. And we know that part of this healing is healing what needs to be healed in us. So we surrender what does not serve anymore to make room for more of the light and love of spirit. We include our parents and children, grandchildren, friends, neighbors, everyone we hold dear, and we know that right where they are, they are surrounded by the light and love of pure spirit. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And we include all people who are engaged in the civil discourse right now, knowing that they are coming from that highest and best place within themselves, that it really is from a place of love that things change for good. And so with a heart that's full, I say thank you, God, that this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.